Okay, I am going to be giving an overview of our view on money and uh, in this upcoming series there will be quite a number of people who will be carrying on with this particular view of money which is an alternative to what is normally taught in economics courses. I think it is closer to what is taught outside of economics including in history. Let's start with a quiz. Um, what I'm, I'm going to ask you questions that actually have a correct answer. Okay? These are not matters of theory, ideology, theology, and they are not policy proposals. They are just questions about the way that a sovereign currency works. And by sovereign currency, I mean a currency in which the national government issues its own currency. Okay? such as the United States, Japan, Turkey. This would not include countries that adopt foreign currencies and also would not include European nations that adopted the euro. I'll save just one slide on the euro, but you're going to have in the future a whole session devoted to the euro. Okay? So here we go. Just like a household, the government has to finance its spending out of its income or through borrowing. Is that true or false? Write down your answer. Question two, the role of taxes is to provide finance for government spending. True or false? The national government borrows money from the private sector to finance the budget deficit. True or false? I see a lot of, you're going to get a lot of these wrong. By running budget surpluses, the government takes pressure off interest rates because more funds are then available for private sector investment projects. True or false? Persistent budget deficits will burden future generations with inflation and higher taxes. Running budget surpluses now will help build up the funds necessary to cope with the aging population in the future. True or false? Okay, you can tally your results, they're all false. Every one of those is false. <coughs> Recently, there's a paper at St. Louis Fed. Let me read this and then translate it. St. Louis Fed, if you don't know, is a bastion of monetarism. This is Milton Friedman uh, type economics. So what I'm telling you is accepted from right to left, okay? As the sole manufacturer of dollars whose debt is denominated in dollars, the U.S. government can never become insolvent, i.e. unable to pay its bills. In this sense, the government is not dependent on credit markets to remain <coughs> operational. Moreover, there will always be a market for U.S. government debt at home because the U.S. government has the only means of creating risk-free dollar-denominated assets. Let me translate. Government can never run out of dollars. It can never be forced to default. It can never be forced to miss a payment. It is never subject to the whims of bond vigilantes. Okay? That's what the St. Louis Fed tells us. And you can find virtually identical quotes from Bernanke, from Greenspan. Okay? And really from almost all economists. When President Obama tells you we're running out of money, that the piggy bank is empty, that is just not true. And all economists know that it's not true. Okay, so the question is, why do they lie to you? There's a, a nice little video uh, by uh, Blaug in which he interviews Paul Samuelson. I won't read this long thing. You can see the PowerPoint uh, later. He says, there's an element of truth in the superstition that the budget must be balanced. He says it all times, but then later on, he um, talks about uh, over uh, long period, longer periods of time. It's a, he likens it to an old-fashioned religion used to scare people, okay? Uh, so that they will behave in a particular way. So as we've taken a, we have taken away a belief in the intrinsic necessity of balancing the budget, if not every year, then over a short period of time. If Prime Minister Gladstone came back to life, he would say, uh-oh, what have you done? And James Buchanan argues in those terms, I have to say, I see merit in that view. So he likens it to a superstition, an old-time religion, okay? We have to do this because we have a fear that our elected representatives will spend without limit. 
And so we make up this lie that the federal government is like a U.S. household. You hear this all the time in the debates about the budget. The U.S. government is like a household. That is not true. Unless you have a printing press in your basement and you're printing up dollars, you are nothing like the federal government. The federal government creates money as it spends. So the framework that I am working from, called modern money, um, will use modern money to answer these sorts of questions. What is money? Why is it accepted? What's the relation of the government to its money? What is fiscal policy and what is monetary policy? Almost all the conventional wisdoms that provide answers to these have got it wrong. Okay? Are these things money? The top one is a rock that 500,000 years ago um, some humans made scratches in to record something. We don't know what they were recording. Below that, these are um, bones that are 50,000 years old that humans carved more complicated marks in these to record something. We don't know what they are. Here uh, is some more evidence of things on which humans carved notches or cuneiform. What are these? We know what these are because we can read them. Okay. Does anyone know what the things on the left are? Tally sticks. Okay. Stock and stub. And we, we all have heard the term. Raise a tally. So the crown, when he wanted to buy sheep from you, would issue a tally stick to you. Okay. You would accept this in payment for the sheep you sold to the king. Okay? And there would be the stick is split into stock and stub to keep a record. Okay? And uh, the clay shibati tablets Michael might be talking about. How about these? Okay, finally you see something, you, ah, there's money. Okay, what are these? These are records, just like the tally sticks. They're records of credits and debits. And of course today, the currency is fairly insignificant. Most of these records are kept electronically on balance sheets. Okay, so what is money? It's a social unit of account. And in fact, it is almost always a state money of account. In the United States, it's the dollar. Okay? Speak up, really? I sounded loud to myself. <laughs> um, it's a record of a debit or credit. The dollar, our money unit, is like an inch, or a foot, or a pound, okay, or a liter. It's a measuring unit. We then have money things that are denominated in our money unit. It's a little bit confusing in the United States because we use the word dollar to indicate both the measuring unit and the thing that's being measured, a little piece of paper that's green. Okay? That has not always been the case in uh, monetary history, but in the United States it is true. We then have a hierarchy of these money things. My <coughs> professor, Hyman Minsky, used to always say, you know, anybody can create money, and he meant money things. Then he would add, the problem lies in getting it accepted. The government's money things are widely accepted. My money things are much less widely accepted. There is a hierarchy of these money things. The important thing is almost always the money things are denominated in the state's money of account, dollars. I could issue money things denominated in rays, okay? But it's much more common to denominate them in the state's money of account. What backs up our money? When I started teaching in the early 80s, I would ask my students, and probably three-quarters of economic students said gold. Well, it wasn't true even then, okay? Today, almost nobody is confused about this because we have Ron Paul running around saying, we need to back our money with gold, right? So now they know that it's not. I like to, to read what it says on the paper currencies. U.S. dollar, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. So more sophisticated students would say, ah, it's legal tender. And it's true, many currencies, have a statement like that. Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, UK pound. Get out the pound and look at it. It says, picture the queen. 
I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pounds on a five pound note. So in other words, if you take that five pound note to the queen, she promises to pay you another five pound note. That's all she promises. No gold, no legal tender. She promises to give you another one in exchange. Okay, so, and in Europe, no legal tender laws. So what backs these things up? So some even more sophisticated students would say fiat. The government just says it's worth it all. That gets a little bit closer to the truth, but it sounds like there's nothing that backs up the currency. You don't want to look behind the dollar bill. There's nothing there, right? Okay, the alternative view, modern money view. Use of the currency and value of money are based on the power of the issuing authority, not on intrinsic value. That should be fairly obvious now, okay? Where most of our money things are just electronic entries on balance sheets. Even in the case of the government. That's the way that it mostly spends, not by issuing green paper money, but through an electronic entry. The state played the central role in the evolution of money. I think that Michael will talk about this. And from the beginning, used and in fact purposely created the monetary system to move resources to the public sector. That was the purpose of creating a monetary system. We find, as uh, Charles Gerdhardt says, that in almost every case we have a one nation, one currency. Euroland is the first major experiment in breaking this link between nations and their currencies. It's not going so well for them if you're paying attention to what's going on in Euroland. So separate currencies is not a coincidence. It's tied up with sovereign power, political independence, and fiscal authority. As a shorthand, what we say is taxes drive money. Taxes are denominated in the state's unit of account. The state spends its currency into existence. When you got that tally stick from the crown, why on earth would you sell your sheep to the crown for a stick? because you could use your half of the stick to pay your taxes. Now, taxes are just one example of an obligation that the authority can put on you. In the old days, fees and fines were much more important than taxes. But today, it's mostly taxes that drive money. But any form of an obligation that you owe the authorities will work to drive a currency. How does a government, a modern government action spend? Through keystrokes. Okay? When the government wants to buy something or make a transfer payment, social security payment, it credits a bank's reserves and the bank credits your demand deposit. All electronically, that's the way modern states spend. So they are spending their own money unit into existence. Taxes just reverse that. The government debits your bank's reserves, and the bank debits your account. So it's credits and debits. Okay? And banks are sort of like our scorekeepers. They keep track of these credits and debits for us. When the government credits more accounts than it debits, we call that deficit spending. That's what deficit spending is. The government has created more money than it has debited in tax payments. So the government net credits bank reserves, and the bank net credits the account of the recipient. Okay, why does the government sell bonds? The government can buy anything it wants by crediting bank accounts. Why does it sell bonds? It doesn't need its own money from the population. It creates its own money every time it spends. It never needs to borrow. In fact, if you look at the balance sheets, there is no way that the currency issuer can borrow its own currency. That makes no sense at all. And in fact, it could not be done. So they don't borrow their own currency. Deficit spending leads to net credits to banking system reserves. This will normally lead to excess reserves. If we're running a $1 trillion budget deficit, by identity, we're creating a trillion dollars of bank reserves. In normal times, banks don't want to hold excess reserves, so they offer them in the overnight market called the Fed Funds Market in the United States. That drives the overnight interest rate down, okay? Potentially to zero. And so what the Fed does is it sells bonds to drain excess reserves. 
So bond sales are actually part of monetary policy, and it really doesn't matter whether it's the Fed that sells them or the Treasury that sells them. The purpose of selling bonds is to drain excess reserves from the banking system so that the central bank can hit its overnight interest rate target. Otherwise, the interest rate would be driven to zero. Okay, we're in unusual times right now where the Fed wants the interest rate to be about zero. So it can leave excess reserves in the banking system, but this is not normal. Um, so really, bond sales have nothing to do with borrowing. They're not part of the fiscal operations of the state. They're part of the monetary policy operations to hit the interest rate target. And uh, just in parentheses, a budget surplus is the opposite. You're always draining the reserves out of the system. You've got to put them back in. You do that through open market purchases. Central bank policy. There, we've had a long history of debate about what the central bank uh, should do. Should it have a money target? Should it have an inflation target? Should it have interest rate targets? Okay, there, economists have finally reached a consensus. Okay, one that we discovered a long time ago, which is that central banks always operate with an overnight interest rate target. No matter what they tell you, that's what they're actually doing. An overnight interest rate target. And that means that they have to accommodate exactly the demand for reserves or they'll miss their target. And that is why they use the bond sales or bond purchases in order to make sure banks have the right amount of uh, currency reserves. What this means is that the interest rate is set by the central bank and they hit their interest rate target through the open market operations. Okay? Now, they set it anywhere they want. If we want zero interest rates, we can have zero interest rates. It doesn't matter whether the budget deficit is a trillion dollars or we have a budget surplus. We can hit our interest rate target. This is not true for a country that is not sovereign in the, the currency sense that I'm using that term. So, for example, Greece cannot set its interest rate. Okay? It is subject to the bond vigilantes. The United States is not, and neither is Japan. And note, Japan has budget deficits even bigger than ours, and they've been doing it for more than 20 years and has zero interest rates all along, because they want them to be zero. So far, everything I've told you is a description of reality. There's no policy recommendation, there's no theory involved in this. I didn't say anything about what the government ought to do, I'm describing what the government actually does. Okay, we can move on to policy that could follow from this. And here I'll um, rely on Abba Lerner, uh, what he called the principles of functional finance. Here we're talking about should, not what the government actually um, does. The government should spend more if there's unemployment. If you have unemployment, it means government spending is too low. You need to spend more. If the unemployment rate is 8%, forget the budget deficit, it's not important. We cannot go insolvent, we can never miss a payment. We have to solve the unemployment problem, okay? So government should spend more. Government can also reduce taxes. It's usually less effective, but that's also a policy option. The government should supply more money, what he meant was bank reserves, if interest rates are too high, okay? Of course, that's not a problem right now. We're supplying plenty of reserves, and the banks have plenty of excess. And he uh, insisted that the budgetary outcome and the government debt outcome should never be a primary consideration. What matters is unemployment, inflation, and where the interest rates are relative to where you want them to be. Now, governments are not financially constrained, but they do impose, self-impose constraints on themselves. Okay? These may be a good idea, they may be a bad idea, the point is they are self-imposed. We have a variety of self-imposed constraints. We have a budgeting process. That is a self-imposed constraint. And it's probably a good idea to have a budgeting process, okay? We have debt limits in the United States, we're kind of unusual. We say, we tell the federal government, go ahead and spend this amount per year, but oh, but if you get up to the debt limit, you can't spend. This is probably not a very good self-imposed constraint, but we imposed it on ourselves. We can remove it any time we want, and normally we remove it every time we reach it. Okay? This next time around, maybe we won't, okay? but it's self-imposed. Markets don't impose it. Okay? It doesn't come from any law of nature. We imposed it. And we also have operational constraints. And so people will say, well, hold on, what you told us before isn't quite right. 
because the Treasury has to write checks on its account at the central bank, the Fed. Okay, this is true. The Treasury has to have money in its account at the central bank. But we found ways to make sure it always has the money in its account because otherwise it would be bouncing checks to Social Security recipients, for example. So we never have the Treasury running out of money in its account. And I can talk about that if you want. And when Stephanie Kelton comes, she's the best on this topic. We also have the central bank is prohibited from buying Treasury debt new issues. So the central bank can't buy bonds directly from the Treasury because that would allow the Treasury to very easily always have money in its account. Okay. But again, we get around this very easily. The Treasury just sells them to banks, and then the, the uh, Treasury's account at private banks is moved to the Fed. Okay? And then the Fed buys the bonds from the banks. So we, they get around it easily, but the point is it's self-imposed. They use special depositories and special uh, tax and loan accounts. Summary. Am I doing all right? Okay. Uh, deficit spending creates private financial wealth net credits. Note that central banking operations do not. We've got, we've got uh, the Fed doing its best, I suppose, to stimulate the economy, but the problem is it can't provide any net credits. It can buy assets from you, but it can't spend money into existence. It has to lend money into existence or substitute assets you've already got for a credit at the Fed. This doesn't stimulate much. This way quantitative easing hasn't done anything, and it won't. All it can do is drive interest rates to zero. That's it. The Treasury spends money into existence. It's much more effective. It doesn't matter whether bonds have to be sold first, which is one of the self-imposed constraints, so long as the central bank accommodates reserve demand. Uh, there uh, is no limit on the Treasury due to this self-imposed constraint. It doesn't matter whether the central bank is prohibited from buying new issues. It goes round about that um, through the banks. And it doesn't matter whether Treasury must have money in its account at the central bank to spend. Uh, the central bank and banks cooperate to make sure it always has the money in its account. Euro, one slide. This is an example of a non-sovereign currency from the point of view of the individual member states. They gave up their own sovereign currencies, the lira, when they joined the union. They adopted what is essentially a foreign currency for each one of these states. They became very much like USA states. And this is what we argued from before the time that uh, the EMU began. We said they're going to be subject to the market in the same way that Mississippi is subject to the market. The only surprise is that markets ignored that fact for as long as that they, they did. They are constrained in their spending uh, by tax revenue, bond sales, and ultimately by the willingness of the ECB to lend to them and to buy government debt. And we're finding that the ECB is very gradually and begrudgingly doing this. Okay, But there's a great uncertainty over how far this will go, and that's why Euroland is in such a mess. The problem is, Although the ECB has been behaving in a way similar to what the Fed is doing, they have nothing like Washington, Uncle Sam, to provide spending euros into existence. So the ECB can lend them, but they have no equivalent to Washington to spend them into existence to solve their problem. Conclusions. Currency issuing government spends by crediting bank accounts, taxes by debiting those. It can always afford to spend more. There still are issues such as inflation, exchange rate effects, and interest rate effects. Okay? But there is no affordability problem. When the president tells you he's run out of money, that is just not true. Sovereign currency gives more policy space. There's no default risk. The government can control its interest rates, and it can use policy to achieve full employment. Now, I need to be careful because people hear things I didn't say. So let me go through a few things I did not say. I did say sovereign government faces no financial constraints. It cannot become insolvent in its own non-convertible. That just means we don't promise to exchange it for gold or for foreign currencies at a fixed exchange rate. But it can only buy what is for sale. It can't buy things that aren't for sale for its own currency. For the United States, this is not a problem. Everything for sale in the United States is for sale in dollars. But that's not always true. 
even in some countries that have sovereign currencies, there are things not for sale in their own sovereign currency. So that can be a problem. I did not say the government ought to buy everything for sale. Okay. The size of the government is a political decision with economic effects. Is our government too big? That's a political question. Okay. Could we afford a bigger government? Of course we could. Should we have a bigger government? Political question. Okay. With economic effects. I did not say that deficits cannot be inflationary. If government spending is too high, you can get inflation. Okay. Um, I did not say that deficits can't affect exchange rates. If our government spent more, ran us up to full employment, it's possible the dollar could devalue. I'll tell you the empirical evidence for that is extremely poor. There is no direct link between the size of government spending and the size of budget deficits and the value of a currency. Okay. Uh, Alan Greenspan said, we have no economic model that is able to explain exchange rate movements. Okay. And the reason is because speculation plays such a big role. And finally, I, um, uh, if a sovereign government lets its currency float, that gives it more policy space. I won't go through that now, but people who studied economics know what I mean. Um, and floating means a currency can go up and down. So yes, it's possible that fiscal policy and monetary policy that are adopted to achieve full employment, for example, could have impacts on the exchange rate. Thanks. You can uh, read more at um, the blogs or at the, the Levy Institute or email me. And I hope that this will be up online. Thanks.